All right, this is part two, modes of testing for sleep apnea. Now, hopefully you already watched part one, which is an overall explanation of sleep apnea. The more people understand about the entire process or about their disease, the more invested they are in fixing it or getting better or understanding it. And so that's what this entire video is for. Now, first an introduction, my name is Jason. I'm a registered polysomnographic technologist, and I've worked for 20 years in the field of sleep medicine. I've literally done just about everything that you can do in the field of sleep medicine. And so I wanna share what I know with you. Now, many of you already know me from my YouTube series, uh, The Lanky Lefty 27, where I do what I call infotainment. I try to make it fun. Look, sleep apnea is extremely boring. I try to bring you information that you need, and I try to do it in a fun way. This video is not gonna be that. I'm gonna to try to get right to the point on all of these. We might have a little fun, but not too much. Please keep in mind, a lot of members of my family have sleep apnea, as do I. So I look at this as you guys are my extended family. I want you guys to get better. And if you have questions, go ahead and ask them in the comment section down below. One more point that I need to bring up is this video is sponsored by me. Amazon purchases are at an all time high, so please consider using my Amazon affiliate link down in the description box below. Are you not using the affiliate link? You make Boof McTavish pause on drinking his mocha latte capilata papa? You can use my Amazon affiliate link for anything. Just know that whatever you buy, anything at all, I earn on all qualified purchases. Boof is tired of being pushed out. Wow, that's a great price. Boof McTavish always uses the affiliate yeah, link. I will also be mentioning other products and services that I provide during the rest of the video when it's appropriate. And I'll let you know about that. And uh, I'll tell you why I'm better. So in modes of testing, everything we saw before, uh, central sleep apnea, mixed sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, hypopneas, and reras, what is an appropriate way to test for that? How do you know if you actually have sleep apnea? Well, the most common form of testing, actually probably not even the most common anymore, but the number one, the gold standard way of testing would be called a type one study. The number one main criteria for a type one study, that'd be called an in-lab study. You're also, you're being monitored, someone like myself, either a registered sleep technologist, sometimes a respiratory therapist, um, and sometimes someone who's a trainee, but much less likely nowadays. So in a type one study, you are being monitored, you are in a lab. You also have something like 20 plus sensors on you. So you'll have EEG, which is monitoring your brain activity. You'll have reference leads. You'll have leads next to your eyes right here. You'll have chin leads right here. You'll have a nasal cannula. You'll have here and here, you'll have uh, EKG patches for your heart, and sometimes another one uh, down here. You'll also have, importantly, you'll have these belts that are coming around. You have a thoracic, otherwise known as like your chest belt, and your another belt down here, down by your abdomen. You'll also have leads on your legs. So all of this paints a really clear picture of your sleep. We can see what stage of sleep you're in. We can see if the apnea is a central apnea, a mixed apnea, any of those different apneas that we discussed earlier on, we can see exactly what is going on and what's causing it. The other nice thing is we can intervene in the middle of the night. So if you pull out the cannula, which is measuring your breathing, technician can come back in and place it in. Also, if it looks like your sleep apnea is very clear, we can also take care of your apnea all on one night. It makes it really nice. So for the first two, three hours, you're having very clear apnea. We can come in, we can put CPAP on you, increase the pressures of CPAP. And by the time the study's over in the morning, hopefully we have you diagnosed and we have you on the right treatment settings so you can go home and be treated as quickly as possible for your sleep apnea. So what are some of the bad things about this? Is one, you're being tested on really one night of sleep. Uh, and in this case, if it is a split night where you do a baseline and you do CPAP, you're really only being tested on like half the night. So sometimes people really don't feel good about being tested on like just four hours of sleep. Like their entire, <laughs> their entire sleep pattern is based off of these three or four hours. But in reality, if someone has sleep apnea that clear, it's really not going to vary much night to night. So it's really not something I'd put a lot of thought into as far as, you know, God damn it, that's, that's wrong. So anyway, that's a nice thing about an in-lab study. Uh, but also the bad thing. Another bad thing is it's in a strange bed in a strange facility, strange room. Climate control might not be something you can control. Uh, but the nice thing is, is it does remove the variables from your home. So you don't have a cat walking across your head or your wife or husband elbowing in your face. Um, things like that, neighborhood sounds. It eliminates all those variables, but it brings in some others. All in all, I think it's probably still the best way of being tested, but you know, who knows, that's up to you. Now, another way of being tested is a home sleep test. So sounds exactly like what it is. You're being tested at home. Now there's a type two home sleep test. 
Actually, this is a good spot for me to mention this. I have a, a type two home sleep testing company. It's called axgsleepdiagnostics.com. And the difference between a type two test and a type one test being in lab is really you're not being monitored by anyone. So you're gonna have mostly the same setup but no one watching you. So some of them will have, I think the requirement is seven, seven parameters, which is exactly pretty much what mine has. So mine still has all the leads that I discussed before. It has EEG, it has eyes, it has chin. We have the belts, we have EKG for your heart. We even have legs if you want them. So it has everything you want. The only thing is you're in the comfort of your own home and you do not have a technician watching you. So the bad things about it is if you pull the cannula out, that whole study has been wasted because the cannula is just sitting on your bed and that's really a, an important parameter. Um, the other bad thing is if you do have obstructive sleep apnea, there's nothing that I can do or anyone can do to titrate you and, and get you treatment on that night, which may not really be that big of a deal. And then another positive to that is that your entire night's sleep or even two nights of sleep can be used to diagnose you. Now I find that when I do that, there's really not much variability between the nights. It's actually pretty standard. Uh, yeah, it might be within you know two or three, the apnea hypopnea scale, but really not much to write home about. I'll get to the apnea hypopnea scale in just a minute. Another mode of being tested is a home sleep test type three. Now type three has less parameters. Type threes are very important in that they do not have EEG. Now you might be going like, oh, who cares? I don't care about EEG. EEG is extremely important because the other two, type one and type two, both take into account your sleep and your sleep time. And I'll tell you why that's important in just a second. Now type three does have nasal cannula and it does have belts. It also will have like a position sensor so you know if you're on your side and if you're on your back. Then there is a type four test, which is usually just a cannula, just a belt, and then finger probe, if even that. Okay, let's get back into the apnea hypopnea index and why sleep time is important. So remember type one test, an in-lab study, and a type two are the only that have sleep time associated with them. Why is the sleep time important? It's important to get an accurate AHI, which is your apnea hypopnea index, or your RDI, which is a respiratory disturbance index. Let's start with an apnea hypopnea index first. The way it's calculated is apnea hypopnea. You add up all apneas and all hypopneas. Now, if you watch my first video, you know exactly what those are. If you haven't watched it, go back and watch it now because I'm not repeating myself. First thing you need to do is know is that apnea hypopnea index is an index of the number of apneas and hypopneas per hour of sleep. So you need to take your entire sleep time and you need to divide that by 60. That'll give you the time in hours. Now you take your entire number of apneas and hypopneas, and you divide it by the number of hours slept. So it could be like 2.5, could be eight. Whatever that total number is, you divide it by your hours of sleep and you get your apnea hypopnea index. Now a normal sleep is under five, apnea hypopnea index of five. Mild to moderate is at five to 15. Usually 15 to 30 is considered moderate, and then 30 and up is considered severe sleep apnea. What's the highest apnea hypopnea index I've ever seen. I believe it was like 130 or 140. So you can imagine how fast that is, how rapid, back to back to back to back. So when we're trying to calculate the RDI, the respiratory disturbance index, we're actually including all apneas, all hypopneas, and we're also adding in all RIRAs. Again, these were mentioned in the previous video. So the R RDI is an entire measure of your breathing disorder. Anything that's waking you up that's respiratory related is gonna be reflected in your RDI. This is my frustration with people only being diagnosed off of the AHIs. They may have an AHI below five, but yet their RDI is in the 20s and 30s and sometimes even 40s, and they're denied treatment because of this. These guys are walking around like zombies all the time because they're so tired but it's not being reflected in the study because it's not being scored. So now you can see that sleep time is actually very important. Now, if you're having a type three or a type four home sleep test, from start to finish, they, they basically assume all of that is sleep time. Well, maybe you only slept for four hours of that, or maybe you only slept for two hours of that eight hour time slot. And the other times you're sitting there moving around and not breathing normally because you're moving around. That's gonna be auto scored as an apnea or hypopnea very, very frequently. So if you wanna have the most accurate apnea hypopnea index, you absolutely must. It's imperative that you have a type one or a type two test. The only exception to that is if someone is very, very clear. People who are super severe, like that person that have the apnea hypopnea index like 60 and above, type three test actually works really well for those people because that's a pretty difficult thing to fake. You'd have to literally be sitting there the entire night holding your breath and breathing, holding your breath and breathing. And no one, I don't think anyone could do that while consciously, like while awake. Now there is one other mode of type two testing and that is called the watch pat. 
The watch pad is a very interesting thing. I don't know what my thoughts are on it at this point. I know Kaiser uses them extensively. Now what it does, it's a little watch that you wear around here, then it has a finger probe, and that gets, that's part of the PAT, which is the peripheral arterial tone. From the tone of your arteries, it infers what sleep stage you're in, and whether you're breathing, having an apnea, or a hypopnea. Um, these are used so frequently, I wanna reserve uh, my judgment on it because I think I'm gonna have an opportunity to use one and I'm gonna wear it. I'm gonna wear my, my own personal type two sleep test with it. But basically when the patients come back with these, they just download them and within like a minute, it's auto scored them and it prints out the report. To me, this is just crazy how it could be accurate. Uh, so I wanna test it out before I actually say it's, it's great or it's terrible, but it is another option out there. It's just what, what scares me about it is that there's not someone actually looking at the data. And from what I know, from my experience, auto scoring of sleep studies is really bad when the computer tries to do it. Now, if you're gonna include other things like Fitbit as far as how they uh, can monitor your sleep, just get out of town, stop that. I have a video all about that. So the next video is going to be Part three, it will be treatment options for sleep apnea. Thank you to anyone watching this video, but an extra special thank you to my top level Patreon supporters. Thanks buddy to Ken Spackman, Alan Liu, Matthew Gray, Stuart Hethington, and Mona Swearingen. Thank you and thanks buddy. Wolf and Kervish always uses the affiliate link.